up everybody it's the debut episode of few podcast uh i'm one of the group of hosts drew austin and we'll introduce the rest of the crew shortly um but just to give you guys all a little bit of context about how this crew came together um the we're these are you know we're all five close buddies we uh we really got together tight during the during the pandemic we really started to come together talk web3 talk crypto talk nfts and um, we kept it going. We actually had a couple of retreats. Um, we, we had these retreats at, the, at, a, at my place up in Warwick. And we ended up forming a DAO called the Warwick DAO. And we've now expanded that into something where we've kept it going. And we just kind of all discussed the news, the relevant topics. It's been the way that like a lot of us have really kept up to speed with crypto and Web3. So we kind of brought up the subject. Alex and I, You got many of you know that Alex and I have been doing a show now for like two years um and uh you know we kind of said let's let's expand this because it's really an opportunity where alex and i would just jump on a call every friday and just be like hey what's up and we figured let's bring a few more friends into the fold where we can all have our weekly conversation just to talk through what's going on in crypto in venture in web3 on across the blockchain ecosystem just to keep people up to speed on the new developments and the progress because even in a down market we think that it's going to be really helpful for people to be knowledgeable about, about what's happening and really informed so that we can all make informed, like, uh, you know, informative decisions in, uh, and, and do it in a fun style. So first I'll kick it off to Alex because, um, you know, Alex and I were running the, uh, the Upstream podcast for a year. So Alex, why don't you uh, reintroduce yeah. yourself to the crowd that probably came from Dudas' following? Yeah. <laughs> well, by the way, first of all, I figured out who Jonathan 1945 is. It's King. He's messing with us. I forgot <laughs> that. that uh, yeah. So, if anyone who knows Gobble Down, it's King. He, uh, he is what a guy. My, Thank you. What a guy. Yeah. So, um, and also, Drew, you don't look anything like your uh, the cover photo of your uh, <laughs> high school photo, but that was definitely the vibe that I was rocking in my yeah. uh, in high school years. <laughs> yeah, you're you're like straight out of like uh, like was, what is it like Wingster? Beastie like Boys. 50 cent, the Fifty Cent uh, music video. Um, Hey, everybody. I'm Alex, I'm the co-founder of Upstream and Truth. And um, yeah, I'm just here to have fun. Drew and I have been hosting these for, what do we get to, like 130? I think yeah. 130 weeks. Um, and now we're moving over to this. And I think this is going to be fun. This is going to be like, uh, I don't know, every, every week we'll just talk about what's going on. I, I think, you know, a lot of it will be NFTs, but I think beyond that, just blockchain, um, crypto, sort of just technology. All of us before crypto, we've all just sort of like knew each other in some capacity and we're all like just interested in technology. So if one week we want to talk about AI, we'll just talk about AI. If one week we want to talk about, you know, Apple's, you know, headset, whatever, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, sure. So yeah, I'm excited about this. So I all think right. uh, adding, adding on to that, I think when Drew and I started talking about all this stuff was during the pandemic, Drew started this Wednesday night call um, we were talking about, we started with stocks. Yeah, stocks. Uh, then we went to I, options. I got boring real quick. Yeah, then we went to options. <laughs> then we went to Drew buy an NBA top shot and just, just you know, trying to convert everyone to, to buy some some Deion Sanders, you know, NBA top shot cards. I know. I know. <laughs> Show, showed how much I knew about that time period when I was just flipping NBA top shots. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that that moved from like, all of us being connected into the world of NFTs to then being deeply involved to then you guys starting projects, getting involved in, in a dramatic way. Uh, so it's been a fun transition of, of these conversations. Anoop, so while we're on you, yeah. why don't you introduce yourself, buddy? Sure. So uh, I'm Anoop. Um, I lead commerce partnerships and investments at Mist and Labs. Mist and Labs is a new, uh, is the original uh, creator of the SWE blockchain we launched in May of this year. Um, and so I focus on on partnerships in the world of brands, um, you know, sports, NFTs, marketplaces, kind of covering anything direct to consumer. And so right now having a lot of fun uh, with sports ball and some music uh, festivals and really looking at where people go and how we can introduce them to the blockchain because they're already there. No doubt, no doubt. Goldberg, why don't we uh, have you uh, give us your story? Sure. What's going on? I think it would be funny if we all told the story of how we each met each other person for the first time. I feel like I have a very different, unique story for each of you. 
My favorite might be Anoop, who I probably met 15 plus years ago yep. in the world of fashion, uh, if you can't tell. Uh, <laughs> the specimens you see in front of you. Uh, but anyway, I'm David. I am a partner at a venture capital firm called Alpaca VC. Uh, we're early stage investors at the intersection of the digital and physical worlds. Most recently, last couple of years, that's taken us into Web3. I am probably these days one of the more cynical, bearish people on this panel. And yep. so uh, look forward probably to the uh, many debates. Gober, you got to say what that startup was. It was a bow tie subscription company. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, you, you vibe exactly. <laughs> well, you're the founder bow tie. of a bow tie. You subscribe to them. I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Wait, and then, wait, and then, wait, Goldberg, can you go? Are we going to go around and say how we met each other? Because I think that's actually pretty funny. I, I'm actually I, I, I thinking. I honestly spoke way too much pot to remember. All yeah, that. I'd have to do. I'd have to really. <laughs> no, I, I remember each person. Goldberg, we met in a, in a, poker, in a room. poker room. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was sort of the second meeting. That was like the let's meet again before we go to Miami and that's retire. True. Uh, yeah. I think I met Drew originally through ex-girlfriends that were best friends. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah right. years ago in New York City. Yeah, all right. I, I don't know. This here and he had a lot more hair. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right, Mikey Dudas, tell us your story. Last. <laughs> yeah, look, I'm I'm just here because you know when I'm perusing you know, Twitter and Telegram on a Friday afternoon. I need something else to do while I'm multitasking. I can think of <laughs> no, no better folks to multitask with than, uh, than you four. So I'm absolutely excited, thrilled. And look, I, I think we've been, as a uh, crypto ecosystem, elevating the conversation a bit too much over the past couple of years. And so I'm excited to level it back down to where people can actually comprehend and understand what we're talking about. What are we going to talk about? Few will understand, <laughs> but few will yeah. really, understand. Few will really few will understand this. All right, all right. So, well, let's... I remember Dudas, we met in the Google cafeteria. Yes, yes. Alex hit me up for a free lunch in like 2013, I think it was like 13 years ago. <laughs> yeah. it'd be about. Um, unfortunately, yeah, yeah I've uh. I've since lost all perks and I have to work from <laughs> from from my empty home office. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I say like before we even jump into some of the news and topics, why don't we even just all touch on your first interaction with Crypto Web3? So like what was your first touch point with um, Crypto Web3? I could just, you know, I'll start it off. 2013 for me, um, I remember the first time I ever bought crypto. I had to just, I actually had to meet um this guy I, I was in merrick i went back to like long island my hometown me and a buddy we went and had to meet someone in like a court in like a dolphin like in this like you know kind of street where you usually meet people to buy pot um we met this guy <laughs> i had to scan you would know a, nothing about that drew I, yeah exactly i brought a i had to bring i had to scan a qr code that he had printed out and showed me and i scanned the qr code and handed him cash and that was my first ever Bitcoin. Um, so that was around 2013, which what was price such was a that at? which by the way, like at that point, I completely was on board with the fact that everyone was like, oh, everyone's using this to buy drugs. Like I literally bought it from the same place I used to meet people to get bud. So it just was a very odd situation for me. But you know, fast forward all those years later, like I, you know, I ended up buying NFTs in 2018 um, on Super Rare, and I got really into it. And one of my friends recently was like, "You're the only person I've ever met that actually buys NFTs for the art." Um, but I, and I will take, I will take some. Uh, I will say that that is definitely one of my things. But um, yeah, that was my first interaction. Dude, what was yours? Yeah. So. You know, it depends on kind of if we're talking about crypto or Web3. Uh, my first interaction with crypto was like, you know, being introduced to Bitcoin in 2013. Uh, I was actually working at Venmo at the time and, and it was owned by Braintree, a payment processor. And we were actually talking with Coinbase about adding Bitcoin payments uh, to some of the customers of Braintree, including Uber and Airbnb. And uh I was wowed by this notion of a you know, global, low cost, uh, accessible to anyone, you know, instant settlement payment uh, network. And you know, obviously that's in, in hindsight, not what, what Bitcoin is, you know, fees are high and uh, you know, it's a volatile currency, but it certainly presaged uh, things like stable coins. And so it was a really exciting time 
for me, you know, bought some Bitcoin around that time because Chama uh, Palatapia wrote a piece called Schmuck Insurance. And he said, hey, the world's sort of going to hell and chaos. Uh, so you should all, you know, you should buy some Bitcoin as a hedge. So I did. And unfortunately, it worked out really well as a hedge if you bought it in 2013. And and frankly, I think it's part of the story of, of today. I mean, Bitcoin is, you know, as of October 20th today, while we're recording this, Bitcoin's up today. And uh you know, frankly, I think it's because there's a lot of uh, financial and government instability and, and it looks pretty, you know, the geopolitical landscape looks pretty unstable. So anyway, that's the really serious side of how I was introduced to crypto. The Web3 side, you know, like many of the folks here, got really intrigued uh, by NBA Top Shot back in uh, 2020 and uh, started buying some packs cheap. You know, not really expecting anything, just collecting after I read a blog post from Fred Wilson, who was an investor. Uh, in Dapper and uh, and then looked like five months later and like these packs and these players that you know, I'd paid a couple hundred bucks for were worth like you know, 10, 15,000. I was like, holy smokes, we got something going here. Uh, and that was my introduction to quote unquote Web3, but but to NFTs. And then through that, you know, met Drew and, and met a bunch of the other folks here, um, you know, trading collectibles. And I think that was the first introduction to hey, it's not just like trading these things with your friends and your neighbors and like going to physical shows, but there's this global market. And by the way, the asset itself is not static. It's this like dynamic thing uh, that's really exciting. And obviously, you know, NBA Top Shot was uh, one of the first you know, instances of showing how these digital collectibles and communities are more exciting than what came before. No doubt, no doubt. Uh, Alex, what about you? First, first uh, crypto? Yeah. <laughs> Um, first time was 2010. Um, and I got hit up by my buddy, Chris Peck. And he was like, Hey, you're working at aviary at the time I was working at a company called aviary. He's like, you're working at aviary doing, you know, I was like sort of doing business development stuff. And he's like, you're doing, um, sort of API integrations and partnerships for the photo, a photo editing API. Do you have any interest in a payments API? There's this startup we just invested in called Dwala, and um, they're looking for someone in New York. So I met uh, the founder, a guy named Ben Milne, and um, that was the f uh, that was the first time I sort of heard. I, I saw like what Bitcoin was, but that was the first time I bought my first Bitcoin. Um, and yeah, Bitcoin was like four bucks. I did not buy enough not to be here right now. And um, <laughs> yeah, I just, so I was, I sort of had a front row seat to, you know, the booms and the busts. Um, I remember when Bitcoin hit like 40 bucks, we're like, oh my God, this is amazing. Uh, and then, uh, and then it crashed down and then went up and then crashed down. So I, I sort of got numb to all the like, sort of the booms and busts. Um, but uh, that was the first time I got into sort of crypto. And then, even when I left in 2014, we still, my co-founder, Michael and I, we still would like, we messed around with when Ethereum came out, we had a, we were working out of the alley. I don't know if people remember the alley NYC. Yeah. Yeah. The alley NYC. <laughs> the and NC. we didn't have to pay for electricity. Yeah. And we, uh, we had an Ethereum rig. Uh, we were mining Ethereum every day. Um, just like, uh, sorry, Jason. For <laughs> the place. But um, yeah, we, that was fun. And then, you know, we played around with the ICOs. Still own like <laughs> random shit coins, like like remember Golem, like GNT or whatever. Um, anyway, so we did a lot of that, and then uh, and then I first got into really Web three and crypto was was I think Drew, you know Drew. Uh, I was living in Miami already, um, although like I think I may have bought a Crypto Kitty back in the day um, when it came out because it was like fun and funny, but I, I have no idea where the, the wallet would be for that. Um, but uh, Drew came to Miami and uh, we had known each other, but we never hung out really. Um, and I think I knew Drew as like the, uh, was the, uh, the Google Glass guy. Yeah. He was yeah the Google sure. Glass guy. Yep. And, uh, but no, so Drew came and we hung out at his, at his hotel in the back. And he like, uh, he told his wife to, to shoe off. And we, he showed me <laughs> uh, Zion Williamson and John Morant, you know, uh, series, what it was like season one. Yeah. Um, whatever's and he was like guess how much i paid for these and i was like 
like five dollars. He's like, no, I, I spent like ten grand, but they're worth like a no, hundred grand now. Twelve hundred. I remember. Twelve hundred. Yeah. Sorry. Twelve hundred. Now he and, still uh, owns those, by the way, and they're worth twelve dollars. Yeah. <laughs> full full circle on that one. Yeah, but that was my first Web three experience. They still, oh, they are still worth twelve hundred. That would be the most positive <laughs> NFT purchase in quite some time. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's that old up one percent meme. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, but that was my first experience. Yeah, yeah. And then Alex, you dove into Top Shot pretty hard too. Uh, uh, yeah, I know. still, I still own, I still own some. I just, you know, I'm, I'm still there. digging that guy, by the way, which we'll, we'll definitely talk about at some point here. Uh, yeah. David, what, what was your uh, crypto intro? Yeah, I don't know if my stories are that different from you guys, but so I was mostly an observer on like the first wave of crypto. Um, I remember the first time I heard about it and it like started to be a real thing and create a lot of this noise uh, was when I used to play a lot of underground in New York City. Um, and I think you look back now and there's like a lot of correlation between those types of people, risk takers, quants. And so a lot of the people, it was a lot of like hedge fund guys and lawyers and just kind of young tech people who would play and mm -hmm. Uh, they'd all talk about this thing called Bitcoin and crypto. And so I bought a little bit, but I never really got into it. And like you guys, it wasn't really until this like new wave of Web3 um, where I got pretty into it. First couple of weeks of the pandemic, I started cataloging all of my own uh, baseball, basketball and football cards from like when I was a kid 35 years ago, um, brought back that mentality of the collector. And then a couple months later, heard about Top Shot, probably from like Drew and Alex, Got into it for a short bit. Um, and then, you know, the rest is history and probably some of the stuff that we'll talk about over the next couple of months. No doubt. No doubt. Do we hit everyone or Noob? Did you talk no, about no. your uh, Didn't mention mine. Um, so I, I bought some Bitcoin. I remember on Coinbase, like that was a whole thing. I'm trying to, I think it was like 200 bucks. But the real kind of introduction was when Consensus came in and pitched Ethereum's ICO uh, at the family office that I was working at. And I still have that deck. And it outlines like what Ethereum, what is possible with Ethereum in 2023. And it mm -hmm. makes sense now, but in like 2015, 2016, it did not make any sense whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I remember meeting with uh, a guy named Sam Cassett, who was the chief strategy officer. And he came in and he was pitching us and I was just sitting there scratching my head. And it was re like, like, this is intriguing. And then the later that year it was the first Ethereal. Um, it was consensus's first conference and realized that like 50 or hundred of my, you know, acquaintances in New York were all moving into this world. And we were at this conference and Ethereum was at 17 bucks. And then by the end of the conference, it was at like 80. And that was like, oh, this is interesting. One, the smartest people I know are all going to work here. And two, like these price swings are crazy. Um, it's probably something I want to get involved with. And then sort of the web three side, it was, as I was talking about before that that call that Drew uh, and a bunch of people were on, um, that got me introduced into the world of NBA Top Shot. And then uh, Drew started talking about art. And I was you know, trying to figure out if, if crypto and NFT art would be interesting. And I think it was October of uh, 2019, 2020, uh, Anthony Pompliano wrote uh, it on his newsletter about how he had a custom one of one done by an artist named Fawocious. And I was just like, huh, this is interesting. If in the traditional world, art is kind of curated by curators, what's gonna happen in the digital world? And I was like, oh, like maybe Anthony Pompliano is one of the new curators. And so uh, started buying a bunch of Fiwo art. And so that's kind of where the art side came in. But really it's been all this group that's helped, uh, you know, me make and lose a lot of money in this. All right. <laughs> Yeah. So let me throw something else out there for everybody. So we talked about where we got into uh, to NFTs and we obviously all know that this was like a, a crazy run, crazy. Uh, it was a crazy ride and ups and downs and a lot of upside, a lot of downside where we are right now in the market. Um, a, I'd love to hear what everyone, got, what, what everyone thinks about like where we are today and like, how would you describe what, where we are today? But the other part of it is like, what do you think, do you think that the web three that we all know that we've come to know comes back. And what do you think is the um, kind of like the driving force behind the next wave of adoption of web three? And I, and it could be anything, but 
Anoop, you're shaking your head. What do you have in mind? Any, yeah, uh, any so I, I think Web3 is a Medusa. Comes back in different forms, um, but it's not going anywhere. And so I think, in, yeah, yeah, you like that, right? Um, it's just the first thing I thought of. But it's 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 a different head. It's you know it, we've we've seen in kind of these different um, iterations, and we've been in different cycles now. Of you know, you guys started in 2013. There was the ICO cycle, and then there was the NFT cycle, and it all comes down to like we're still figuring out infrastructure. If you think about it, right, and that's where a lot of v you hear a lot of VC conversations about like infrastructure companies, and you know, as me as like a luddite in understanding how the back end of of crypto works, I don't know why you need a USDC off ramp, and you know, why different countries need on ramps and off ramps and and connectors and all of these things, and so we're still figuring that part out to make all of the things work, but I think this next cycle is going to have a huge uh, focus on gaming. Um, partly because we want it to. I don't know if it'll actually happen, but we we want to see, you know, Web3 uh, be implemented by gaming because there's so many gamers. And then I think the other part that's really going to happen in this next cycle is seeing like interesting brand use cases. Um, that's also my focus. So that's what I think about a whole lot. But, you know, if you think about when brands got involved, it was like 18 months to the day of the NFT cycle starting. And you're, you're even seeing like Michelin, right? Like yesterday they dropped an NFT. Um, it's trading at 0.09. And so I considered buying it. But like Michelin is a tire company, mm -hmm. number one. And number two, like all of us want to go to Michelin restaurants, right? Like we want, we all want that like reservation to go to that place in Norway and and, and grab that, you know, that I, I think that one closed down. But What's those the Michelin utility of the Michelin NFT. So you, you can you can get like one of the things is you can get reservations at top Michelin restaurants. Um cool. and but it's also like connected into their tires, which is kind of funny. Uh I haven't like dug into it too deep, but that's really interesting to me where a company like Michelin where you know, you're kind of blown away that they're going to do an NFT is launching a project in the deep bear market. Yeah. And what that kind of tells me is that it's taken two and a half years for their lawyers to say okay, it's taken time for them to find partners for it to make sense. It's fine. You know, it's taken time to get their VP of e-commerce to agree that like they should do this, their VP of engineering, their VP of supply chain. And just like being on the side that I am, it's really hard to convince all of those people that they should do something in this. So when it actually launches, you know, some consulting firm, some person in the company, some internal champion has really been pushing it. And so I just think we're going to see a lot more brands start to do really interesting things in the space. I think, I think to just to, to piggyback that quickly, like I just was reading today that Epic Epic Games is releasing their first, uh, there's the first NFT game or Web3 game that's being released on Epic by the guys who created uh, Magic the Gathering. And like, I, I also agree, Noop, I also think that, um, I think that gaming is going to be the next big driver. And I think what people don't really understand is that a good quality AAA game takes a really long time to build, like in oftentimes two to four years. So if you think about it in that time frame where let's say NFTs started to get going around 2019, 2020 is when it got even finally hit the map of being discussed. I don't know you guys started entering on Top Shot. 2021 was like the towards the end of it towards the end of like the the early adopter phase and that's when everybody else was starting to come in so if you think about it like 20 it, it takes some time to even release these games but there are a lot of gaming studios that are now in the middle or towards the later half of building these games and my you know my thesis has always been that like the first time a big ip gaming company brings a triple a gaming experience um, and it's connected to an ability where you can go and let's say you steal a car in Grand Theft Auto and then all of a sudden for the first time you can go and sell that car, make $10,000 in crypto, and then where do you go with it? And then I think that's going to open up a lot of the, 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 the floodgates to a lot of new users and new adoption of Web3. So like that's one thing for me. You know, brands, I think, uh, you know, I think brands are a little bit right now shell shocked um, They because they're, you know, brands in general are a little bit more tentative. So I feel like brands are now waiting for this next wave before they start to re-engage again. Um, but I do think that there's going to be much more on the business side, enterprise side. So more 
more commercial use cases, more enterprise use cases, things I'm seeing are things like, you know, mortgage, mortgages on the blockchain or like machine to machine communications on chain. And, you know, especially with AI coming out, like the ability to understand provenance and where things are being created and how they're being created. Um, so like a lot of like content creator tools on chain. So I have a feeling we're going to see how this next wave is going to be about a business is going to be business adoption. Dude, it's like you obviously are very active investor in the space. You know, where do you what do you think is going to be the next like um, kind of a, a driving force of Web3 or and what does it look like? Of Web3 gaming? You know, just Web3 in general. Like if you think about like what do you think is the next big driving force of Web3? Um, yeah. Is it gaming? Is it something else that we're not expecting? And what does it look like when we come out of that? Is it back to where we are today? Is it pure speculation? Is it more use case driven? Like what do you think? Yeah, so uh, a few different things. But the bottom line is we need – uh, more people transacting, you know, online, right? Uh, sorry, on chain. They need to be doing things uh, where they're interacting with blockchains, and you know, they're not just kind of looking at their tokens and centralized entities like BlockFi or Celsius uh, and some of these you know products that that didn't survive. Uh, you know, they need to be. We need to provide uh, consumers and businesses with reasons to use and interact with public blockchains. And we need to create uh, infrastructure. You know, so things like wallets, um, you know, things like secure smart contracts that give them the confidence that it makes sense to interact with the blockchain. So you know, what I think has been happening over the past call it, you know, 15, 18 months of this quote unquote bear market is you've seen a lot of investment and a lot of uh, entrepreneurial energy put towards building that infrastructure. So you know, building uh, better systems, more redundancy uh, in products that are on chain and uh, you know, things like magic or you know, things like smart wallets that uh, ensure that people don't have to like manage private keys and do all this confusing stuff, uh, continue to you know, press approvals 10 times uh, in a minute if they're playing a game uh, that's on a blockchain. So you're know, really, really, quote unquote, abstracting away the complexity. So anyway, let's just assume that that's happened. Now we actually need apps. And, and frankly, we don't have enough of them right now. Uh, and, and I mean financial apps. So things like you know, decentralized finance, whether it be uh, you know, stable coins that offer you yield. Like today, if you look at most of DeFi, the yields, unless they're heavily incentivized by you know, airdrop farming and things of that nature, the yields are like below what you can get by keeping your money in the bank, right? And earning 5% of treasury. So it's a difficult time for, uh, for DeFi. And, and we see people working really hard to bring some of those off-chain assets on chain, you know, and, and bring in treasury yields. Um, so if you can create kind of a financial economy where people have a reason to keep their money in Ether and in, in Solana, uh, well, then they're going to say, okay, you know, I've got my money in this wallet. It, it's maybe earning some yield. Now let's actually, you know, participate in this on-chain economy. And the things that you're looking for there are, uh, you know, it could be social use cases, meaning I want to send money to, to somebody, you know, in a different country. So it could just be like remittances and payments of that nature. It could be the you know, whole social thing we've seen with friend tech and others, you know, where there's some kind of like value layer added to the social experiences that we're having in traditional, you know, web two social networks. Uh, and then you, know, you guys talked about gaming. Uh, and obviously, I think you know, for, for these gaming models to work, they need to actually have, uh, you know, I believe they need to be permissionless. So you need to be able to actually trade the assets um, you know, that you're earning, that you're paying for, you know, that you're acquiring through the game. Uh, and you need to basically, if you're earning a fungible token, like you would with Axie, AXS, you have to have a way um, you know, to move in and out of that value permissionlessly. And so you know, what you're starting to see is, I think, emerging signs of that uh, with games and with applications uh, created by teams outside the U.S., we're still in this kind of like in-between regulatory environment in the U.S., which is really difficult to to, to create a game like the criticism is like why do i need these like blockchain games they're not like really doing anything on chain and part of it is like you know the regulatory environment makes it difficult so um you know i'm optimistic that's changing because a lot of entrepreneurs are either relocating outside the us or already exist there and the funding's going to them uh, and the last thing is you know i'd say that uh, the um you know the 
the loops and the things that people are doing just have to be simpler. We saw a lot of AAA stuff uh, you know, that was pitched and you know, people were saying it was coming soon and you know everything in 2021. And like that stuff still isn't here. Um, and I think it would really behoove uh, the ecosystem of folks like startup really with straightforward, simple mechanics that people can understand. And then again, allow them to you know, own things, to trade them uh, in a real value transitional way. And, and to speculate. I mean, it's obviously clear that speculation is, is just a key part of humanity. Uh, and it's something that, you know, can be fun and, and beneficial. And so, you know, I think, again, the U.S. regulators view speculation in many cases as uh, a 100 percent always you know, negative thing. And what's interesting is just, you know, regulators and, and frankly, individuals in other places don't view it that way. It's it's a human fun thing. You know, it's, it's frankly why we have in the United States, you know, state lotteries and, and you know, all kinds of other state sponsored uh, gaming uh, provided that, of course, the state uh, can tax and earn their keep of the proceeds. Yeah. Mike, correct me if I'm wrong here, but you were you were close to the App Store experience, right? When you were at Google. Like, do you think that the the App Store constraints, like Apple and Google and their like their kind of challenges and, and roadblocks they're putting up, do you think they that also has a role in gaming and mass adoption for Web3? Good question. So yeah, my partner Serge Kasarjian was uh, he he worked on the Play Store, uh, but obviously I was you know adjacent to it and no question that the inability to you know basically make a true pure crypto uh, game or application in most cases you know on the device and in the place where people you know the primary means of distribution and consumption uh, certainly raises a bar that's uh, really difficult to overcome. Uh, obviously, with Android devices, you can do things like run your own OS, like sort of sideload a different version of Android. Uh, and they're a bit more permissive. And I think maybe that's why you see gaming taking off in places that aren't as iOS saturated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dave, okay. So you're, you, Dave, you come at this from a little bit of like why, you know, you often ask like, why is the blockchain needed for this? Like, why is the blockchain needed for this? Where does the money come from? <laughs> is, the, is the legendary, the legendary question. But, the, you know, I, I guess I'm curious, like in, in a world where, you know, you, where we are today is uh, like a kind of a, it's, it's a very, there's limited adoption. It's a lot of speculation, but there's also a lot of building going on. You know, what do you see? Where do you see this? What do we, when we come out of this current phase of Web3, what do you think we come out into? I don't know if I know exactly what it looks like, right? If I did, I'd be building it or investing in it. And, and I'm trying to, but I do think it looks very, very different from what it looks like today, right? I think this world of like, PFP collections, even NFTs as like this consumer facing thing that is the project or the product itself goes away. And we shift into all of these use cases that we've been dreaming about now for five plus years, where it's really the underlying technology that drives it. I think right now, it's more that people are marketing to a community of crypto enthusiasts. And it's like, great, I know the market. What can I sell them that's sort of like adjacent to this world? Oftentimes it's speculation and like all the emotions that that drives, that's going to need to completely shift. And I, I do believe as much as I'm a cynic, I'm very bullish on the underlying technology. I think it's inevitable, um, but it'll look very different. And I actually think it's going to take a really, really long time to get there, not only because of the infrastructure and the time to build, but I think by definition, this is like a network effect type of environment, right? We need everybody inside of some ecosystem to be using this and to be doing things on chain for it to really be magical. It's going to take a while to get there, right? By definition, the technology itself, both the friction as well as the stigma gets in the way, right? It, it's a headwind of how it's going to be hard. So we need to really run uphill through that to get to some type of critical mass to then where all of the other buildings starts to matter. Alex, I mean, you were, you've been in community for pretty yeah. much at least 10 to 15 years. Do you think that the, do you think that the, the PFP movement happened because of the pandemic and like the fact that we were all looking for community at that point? I mean, it definitely helped. Um, you know, my, my take on all this, listening to you guys and sort of thinking for myself a little bit, I, I definitely agree with the new originally, um, that like the Medusa thing, you know, I've been in the space for 11 plus years now. And every time it 
dies, it comes back stronger. So for anyone who's thinking like, oh, okay, like NFTs are dead, like something will come that is bigger, um, just in the same way that, you know, DeFi and ICOs and just coins itself. So I'm not really concerned. I think it's just a time, a timing thing. Uh, and meaning it just takes time. So I wouldn't be surprised that in the next year or two, something pops up that becomes bigger than what, you know, the mania that NFTs was. Um, my take on the next thing, though, is I don't really see, I know everyone thinks Web3 gaming, but I don't see the reason why you need to be in Web3 for gaming. Meaning, I don't think that, if you think about it, right, if you're playing the game, right, you just want a fun game to play, or you want to make money, right? If you want to make money, grinding in the game, is that going to really make you the money that you, you were making? I don't think so. Because um, like like Goldberg always says, like, where's the money coming from? So like grinding in a game to make money. So you either like really want to play a fun game, but then like you're not doing the grinding to make money. Like you see all these people grinding in the Yuga stuff and then they're getting like nothing, right? So like, and no, no disrespect to Yuga or anything, but just like, there's not a lot of money when you grind for a game. Um, you just except for the top, like, top, top ten players made, you know, and you had professional esports people coming in to. Play oh, I'm more talking that. about like heavy metal and things like that. The, the more it. recent ones. I'm not talking about Dookie Dash. I think that was like a fun moment. Um, but so on the, on the team side, you're like, all right, I'm making a game, and then like even just Dookie Dash, right? Fun game. I played it a lot. Um, but it, you know, you, just by only allowing the people that hold your NFT to play, you're just never going to grow, right? So, like, that's not going to be a popular game that anyone could play, right? If only your holders can play it, what do you have? Five thousand, ten thousand holders, right? So, just inherently, you're not going to get big. And so, I don't, I don't see, and and then in terms of the ownership piece, right? okay, I have an NFT that I own. I have a sword in a game and I own it. And now I can go bring it anywhere. But like, all right, there's no other game that supports the sword. So who gives, you know, you know, uh, are we allowed to curse here? Yeah, I think so. Who gives a fuck? So like in the end of the day, it's just like, okay. And then if you go the reverse, it's like, well, no, I can resell my sword to other people. And it's like, all right, that, that game's going to allow me to do that because they're selling the same sword. So now I'm competing with the game and taking revenue. So instead of getting direct sales or getting secondary sales or a cut of the sale, it just doesn't really make a lot of sense. So I think the way that I, at least we've approached games and how we think about games, at least on the truth side, is like, you know, games should be fun first. Then they should be like something you want to play with your friends. Um, and then you can take the community that you've built in web three, right. And use that as your ambassadors for the game. So that's like what we sort of did with only up. And that's why, you know, I think every game starts with a small diehard community, like any popular game that's ever existed starts with a small pop, you know, like uh, like rabid fan base. And then it is sort of expands. So like, are we responsible for people like, you know, um, you know, Aiden Ross and, and Dr. Disrespect playing the game? Like, no, but they would never have heard of it if a small group didn't initially start sort of like pushing it out. So I don't know. I'm just not that big. The more I think about it and the more that I dig in, I just don't understand on both sides uh, Web3 Gaming and how that actually will be popular and make money, which is really what anyone here cares about, make money. So uh, like we could put our heads in the sand and be like, no, it's about the community. It's about the art. 95% of people that are here are here just to make money. So yeah, but if you think about, I don't you think, about the think business model, games would do that. If you think about the business model of games today, it's a lot of microtransactions. And if there was anything that Web3 should be capable of delivering on, it's microtransactions, especially because you're selling things to people that they actually own and not just what they get to use in a game for five minutes. Yeah, but they, own for what? Own Dave, for what? Something. What are you thinking? Yeah, Dave's so on my, I, I, my side. He's yeah, I, I align with Alex. Here's the interesting thing. What, what does Web3 stand for, right? It's it's permissionless. It's open. You actually own it. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about a game, there is a central force here that you can't extract from, right? They make the rules of the game. They determine supply. They determine when they want to make more of the thing. They determine the utility and thus the value of it. 
And so you could talk about interoperability and like, is there value away from the game itself? Maybe like, I think the original use case was that, right? Vitalik had some asset in some game and they like shut the game down or they pulled the asset from. Well, if they shut the game down, great. You now own an NFT of a game that doesn't exist anymore. Like there's no value of that, right? If Top Shot shuts down and they shut down all of the challenges and all of that, like I don't believe that stuff is going to maintain value or have value outside of it. And I get there's outliers. You can build your own little fantasy game around it. But like, it's really hard to have this open world connected to a centralized source. There is a much more realistic world where they just turn on some of that functionality, run their own marketplace where you can now sell that sword to the person who wants to buy it instead of earn it inside of the game. Can that be done with Web3? Yes. Can it be done with Web2? Yes. I think time will tell which one is actually the better and easier way to do it. That I mean, that argument also then gives some like it gives some credibility to game networks because if if like I, I also agree like if I you know there's something to be said for you play a game you play that game till like I, if I played Zelda you know I played that game and then when I was done with that game like was the ocarina of time something I needed in the real world like no I was like done with that game and I moved on but like if that game was part of a network of games. And that asset that you created, that you acquired in one game um, had value and the value can then be contributed to another game or another ecosystem that you're playing. And people are kind of moving from game to game and, and within this gaming economy. To me, that makes more sense. I think it's very hard. Where I every agree with that. So Drew, totally I, I agree with that. I think it's something like um, in a future world where there's, let's say, an open metaverse where people spend time online and they're you know, whether it's other side or someone else or like, and there's a world and it's open or wilder world or whatever, and you have an asset there and like, you want to sell it to another person and they can use it in this open world. I think that does make sense. I think we're like a decade, if not longer away from something. No, like that. you think a decade away from network, a network of gaming, a gaming ecosystem like that? I think like a big enough network that like everyone spends all their time there and, and there's a big enough market for this type of thing. I don't see that coming in the next five years. Well, let's, say, let's look at let's look at Zynga as an example for a second. If Zynga became if, if there was a Zynga token and every game that you played within the Zynga ecosystem was powering was 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 utilizing the Zynga token, so you can acquire it in one game, but you can acquire it in another. An asset you acquire in one game can be sold for this token, which then you can use to bring to another game. Do you see, a, like, a better you example would be like Epic Games and skins? And the thing is, is like okay. Epic Games and skins. I'm still, you can buy like season one skins. They go on sale every once in a while. And mm -hmm. like, so I have my, my, my skin of choice right now is the Joker, like the classic mm -hmm. Joker with the hat. And, mm -hmm. and I use all the emotes of like laughing and like whenever I kill people, it's fun. But mm -hmm. if I want to sell my Joker skin to somebody else, right? Um, Epic doesn't want that because they sell that for like 20 bucks. They don't want me to sell it. They don't want to get two, 5% of 20 bucks. They want to get the 20 bucks. And well, no let me put that on you, Alex. How many of those do they sell? I don't know their numbers, but I'm sure a lot. I mean, they've well, got... no. How many are they willing to sell? Let me change the question. However many people buy it on the day that it's available. Right. Infinite is the answer. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they can only get 20 bucks. But what if they said we're only ever going to make 100 of these? That's what I think as well. And yeah. so if that's now worth maybe a couple hundred bucks and you sell it and they make their $30 that way, there, there's a not, world. Now, not to, I would not argue, to that doesn't really need to be on web three because it's going to need to be on epic or steam or zynga and so it's already a closed ecosystem but if that if they if that weapon if there was only a hundred of those weapons and that weapon was material to beating a certain boss in the game but only a hundred people can ever get it then once that person beat the boss he can sell it for more value because it's such in sure. demand all of a sudden you've created this like scarcity, this, this need for value. It Why does that need to be web three? And let me magic the gathering. Someone brought up as a great example. Yeah. That is a game where ownership of assets is a real thing. But does that, is that physical? Are you talking about physical yeah. or digital? Well, they have both. They have physical but and digital. The digital you don't own. That's the whole point. If well, it was on chain, you would. No, no, you right? own it. You, you own it. It's just not on blockchain. People sell these cards. There's huge marketplaces for this. Dudas, what do you think of that? How do you respond to that? Am I going to have to stop my internet surfing to weigh in on this? 
So I do think that there's a point here. I, I think, so what I'm hearing is like talking about, you know, Web3 gaming, like as if the games are going to have the exact same design or look the same as, you know, like traditional both you know desktop and console gaming and then you know mobile gaming and i i just don't think that is what's going to happen um and i kind of said that earlier in my comments where i think we should just start with really simple things like things like honestly the re like you see with like roll bet and things by the way that are not on chain that are off chain but accept crypto you see this like um you know the gambling and, and betting and things that involve speculation uh, and casino type stuff is what's exciting to people. Like you're probably going to start there where there's like real value speculation. And um, I've seen some interesting models that we can actually have a whole episode about uh, as to where like speculative and casino and, and even some skill-based gaming will work online. Okay. What if for, you know, then on the way opposite other end of the spectrum, you're going to have, and, and some, I haven't done a tremendous amount of work here because I'm actually not a huge like gamer um, who gets deep into these worlds, but you see these autonomous world, um, you know, gaming where uh, similar to how Roblox, like people can build their own and, you know, you have mods and other games, like there's definitely going to be an element of you know, creators being able to contribute, create their own environments and get economic benefit uh, from that. And so I think that's like on the other end of the spectrum, really complex, you know, world building, uh, and where people can kind of own their assets and creators can get compensated fairly for that. Uh, to your point, today it happens, you know, within the confines of, you know, the Roblox and Epic, you know, empires and how they compensate people. It'll be exciting to see these open economies uh, emerge. And then I think there's something somewhere in the middle, which is, which is like games that today where you have skins and things like this um, and you have a centralized entity issuing them and to your point and i heard everybody talking about it the the notion of like constrained supply and things of that like there is a world that hasn't worked yet i tend to agree by the way that that inside this middle piece is going to take three five seven years to figure out but where you truly do have like i, I you know the word makes me a little nervous to say but dow or some sort of governance structure where the participants in the game actually have some control over the economy. I mean, this is already happening in DeFi where, you know, holders of collateral can vote on, you know, what other collateral can be used on Aave and can be used on Compound so that people don't put shit coins on there as collateral and then rug everybody, right, by pulling um, valuable collateral out and leaving their shit coins. What's going to happen with a number of these games is you're going to have a group of folks who care in this permissionless environment, who take ownership, who gather tokens, and then begin governance on, okay, well, what should the supply of you know, this type of asset be? And, and, you know, that doesn't mean these people are going to actually have, be out there like coding the game up, but they may actually contribute to the economy. So that's just one example of where I actually think um, I'm excited by uh, quote unquote web three gaming. But yeah, I mean, this is really complex. It's still at the really early experimental phase. Just quick little thing though. So in what David, David's debate is that do, is ownership need to be on chain is what was like, I think a key question that he asked. Do you, what is your opinion on that? Yeah, absolutely. So if you can't see the ledger and if it's not uh, on chain, like I think in the near term, people are willing to make trade-offs to experiment and have some fun. Um, but yeah, if this stuff's ever going to, you know, truly be differentiated from what a centralized entity can do the uh assets need to not necessarily be visible like you don't have to be able to see how much of a certain you know set of nfts and assets mike dudas owns but you definitely they like i need to own them i believe in an on-chain environment where i can use a zk proof that's maybe obfuscating exactly what i own but other than what i want to share or show but yeah you need to prove that i have asset ownership on a ledger that can't be tampered with so yes i do think these things need to be on chain otherwise this web 2.5 bs like it works now it's going to work for a period of time but you know in 10 20 years like kids who are growing up today um aren't gonna really like like it's it's I, I do think it's pretty binary and i think the assets need to be on chain i don't think the gameplay does i think the assets need to be 
Okay, I'm going to do a quick pivot here. We've got about, let's say, 10 minutes left. I want, to, um, I want to touch on a couple news topics for a second and just get some quick opinions on this. And this is also, this was Rapid fun. To fire. I think today's deep dive was uh, gaming, which was also kind of a fun, um, unexpected deep dive since none of us knew where this was going to go. Um, but, uh, okay, quickly, I want to talk about the um, FTX uh, case for a minute because I think that was actually the, the starting point of what... Um, what really caused a lot of the mistrust in the public. I think that like when SBF was coming out every every and every advertisement was trust crypto FTX. Um, and then it turned out they were the most, the, the least trusted, <laughs> trust, uh, least trusted source of crypto. Um, it, it, it really, it, it took a, it took a hit for all of our businesses, you know, funds, investments, startups, you know, everything was really affected. So Anoop, I guess I'll start with you for a quick second. You know, what is your take on what's going on in the FTX saga? I mean, I, I always think of this John Jay quote, who was the new CEO brought in uh, by the legal firm, that FTX was the greatest failure of corporate controls he's ever seen. Um, it was, it, you know, we basically, we trusted these, these quants to just put billions of dollars and they just acted like complete lunatics in trying to buy the world and they got caught. <laughs> and that's the only thing that, you know, in, in this situation, they got caught. I think this has happened in lots of other financial situations. Um, hedge funds kind of funds different way, like not at this scale. Here, it was just like lunatics getting caught and doing just absurd things. And if you if you look at the, 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 the court case, um, Gary Wang the other day, they, they, he took a second $200 million loan to pay the interest on his first $200 million loan. But in court, you know, he said, I don't remember what I spent it on. Just, how do you not know how you rolled through 200 mil? Right? Like, it is just an absurd, like, it's an absurd idea. And, and I can understand why the public will look at this and go, well, look, this is what... You know, they started with buying drugs in a corner and now they're just, you know, buying countries and, and companies and, and everything in between. So and it, it, it just gives us a bad look. Right. Um, that's that's I, I think the most important thing is it just gives a really bad look of how stupid like the fact that every major VC invested in them without without checking or auditing their books. Right, like, it gives us a bad look. Who are we talking about? Right, is this a crypto failure? I would say no. Is it no. a startup tech, maybe a banking and fintech failure? Probably. I, I would say us, as in being <laughs> involved <laughs> in this world, right? Like Crypto's being actively involved world. every day. Yeah, and I also think crypto takes a hit. Actually, I think I, I, I think everyone look everyone looks at FTX as like they're like the Bernie Madoff of of uh, of crypto. Absolutely. So it's like finance is bad because Bernie Madoff. And the banks, it's like FT, it's like, you know, like if Coinbase came out and they were, you know, like it would be over, but it wouldn't really because like this has happened before with like Silk Road and whatever and and um, uh, Mount Gox. But no, it was, it's it's bad. I mean, there's a lot of big companies, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies were getting it in the game of, of Web3 and crypto and they pulled out right after that stuff. So, um, yeah, was, I, I feel like bad. we were we had already done that u-turn to start pulling back on a lot of the nonsense and that was the catalyst that blew it all up and took some of the you know the baby out with the bathwater. i think yes but i th i actually think if you look back that ftx actually blew up a lot earlier than people realize i think it actually blew up in may with celsius and luna and everything and just hit it for a long time um <laughs> There were a couple of weeks where I was like, you know, maybe it's just these headlines. Like maybe they were just sort of stupid and aggressive. And now that everything comes out at trial, you're like, oh, no, no, no. This was like pretty large scale intentional fraud. Just and, and, and basic fraud. Right. It wasn't even, you know, seeing John Jay in, in these interviews. It's like It wasn't complicated. They just lied about what they had. They moved money from one account, one account to the other. And so they had on the like veneer in the front side of this like complicated models and built an actual like revenue generating exchange and then just were stealing money in the background. So it, it, it's this really interesting, complex, you know, technology they built and then just basic fraud in the background. And right. I think that's what was so mind. Yeah, I would agree.
Yeah, Mike, good yeah. question for you. So for some people that don't that don't know this, like what was the like I know Solana what took up was like very well, did we just lose a new by the way? Is he frozen yeah, like he's, that? He's frozen. <laughs> he was so so shocked by the fraud. <laughs> so shocked by, the <laughs> by the way, the, I think the worst people, I mean, everyone's really bad here, but I think I think Sam's parents are like probably really, really like guilty. just bad. Really like really ethics guilty. professors, like oh, yeah, come really on. Guilty. So I think the thing that's been interesting too is it didn't just, and I'll get back to let you ask your question, Drew, but yeah. what's been interesting is it wasn't limited just to FTX. Like this complaint, this Gemini uh, Genesis complaint, you know, that involves DCG and the things that they were doing but before new froze, his points on fraud, um, or we'll call it alleged fraud for now, and just how brazen the conversations were about people covering up like it just these massive amounts of money I can only imagine must have gone to rational people's heads. Just the incredible amount of money in such a short period of time, because these are folks who had in many cases, five, seven, 10, you know, not Sam, but like these other people had five, seven, 10 year reputations of being like absolutely regulatory compliant, building up, you know, really strong risk, um, you know, risk managed organizations. And boy, when you read the stuff that was going down in late 2021 into 2022, uh, in the NYAG report, uh, about, uh, Genesis, you're just like, goodness gracious. Like they knew it was happening and they were covering it up from retail. It's terrifying. It's saddening and it's maddening and we have to do better. Uh, so just to wrap up, you know, we could talk about FTX at a later date, but look, everybody was hoodwinked. You know, people like me were hoodwinked, uh, had, had no idea. You know, I went to that FTX Bahamas event a couple months before it blew up. And I don't think, you know, anybody on the outside really had any idea what was going on. It was a very raucous environment and, and people were excited at the growth of, of crypto. And wow, it came crashing down. We can talk about uh, it again. We'll save, we'll save more conversation for FTX for another episode. But real quick, one, uh, what is your prediction for the outcome of the case for SBF? Alex, go quickly first. I think right. he's going to shock people and he's going to testify. And I think it's going to go crazy. Where, where, think, where do you think, think where do you think ends up? What's the result of this case? Uh, oh, he's going to jail for a long time. Maybe for the rest of his life. Uh, Gober, I don't do think, think so. Gober, what do you think? Like five to eight years. Okay. Do this. It's financial only. Yeah. So I'm, I'm closer to where Alex is. I think, I think he's going away for longer than the people who are conspiracy theorists who think the government's going to protect them. I uh, think he's going away for, it. I think you can just tell by the way they're running their case and by how feeble his defense is. It's, it's not, it's not going to end well. For him, I don't think what I want to know is where Trabuco is Sam Trabuco. Where's this guy? He's out in a boat. He's got, he's he's got out of that. I mean, is he in witness protection? This is wild. He's gotten out of this whole thing. How is that possible? I don't know. I think we know. I'm, 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 <laughs> you know something or someone. I'm predicting 20 years, and he spent and he spends about 12 to 13. Um, which you know, then he get he gets out. He's still young. I mean, what is he? 30. I know 30. a great prediction market. Uh, you know, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> we got to drop some over unders so, here. Okay, you're saying 20 years. I'd say like 30, 30 plus. 30. Plus. Uh, Goldberg saying what? Five. Five. five to seven. Uh, another five question: to seven. Are the parents going away? Thumbs up or thumbs down? No, they're going to skate free. No, I don't yeah, think so. Against him. They, des they deserve it. They, they, <laughs> they should take half of his time, actually, I think. They see, they see the writing on the wall. They've already started to flip. <laughs> All right. There's guys. no parent uh, privilege, only spousal privilege. All right, we nailed it. One hour on the dot. First episode in the books. Um, I, I would tell you all what we're going to talk about next week, but we have no clue, so we'll find out then. <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, we're going to do the same time every Friday, 1 o'clock. Yeah. Uh, join oh, us uh, fo follow us on Twitter. Follow, follow us on uh, Twitter. subscribe to the YouTube channel. Like and subscribe. I've never had to yep, say that like, before. Like, comment, but... subscribe. If you guys do comment, we'll do and our TikTok. best. And TikTok. We grabbed the TikTok yeah, last night. So, yeah. we're question, gonna, guys, on, where on is this going to be available by podcast this evening? Spotify and Apple. You'll be able to hear it on uh, all the podcasts. And Google too, right? I didn't even know Google has this pod podcast. Probably. I didn't either. I think this was just in the show. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. But yeah, right. we'll, we'll get it all up on all the podcast platforms, guys. And um, if you do comment on the YouTube, we'll do our best to check comments and reply and give you context and feedback. But uh, yeah, feel free to be with us every every uh, every Friday, 1 p.m. so we can talk, talk shop. All Later, right. Everybody. Thank you.